Volume Four, Chapter One of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Four, Chapter One. When first Willoughby arrived in London, he had endeavoured to bring himself to a resolution of seeing Celestina, but her absence at the time on a tour of pleasure, and the assurances he received that she was engaged to Montagu Thoroughgood, not only diverted him from that intention, but gave his sister both time and opportunity to represent her as neither wanting or wishing for that attention which he thought he should as a friend shrew her these insinuations had gradually their effect not however in curing that invincible tenderness he always felt for her but in mingling with it so much bitterness that his life became more than ever wretched the accidentally meeting celestina at an assembly gay unconcerned and as he believed forgetting her former attachment to him in her new preference to montague thoroughgood the second meeting which happened at the opera and everything that he heard both from his sister and in general conversation where celestina was mentioned all served to confirm this idea while the letter which would have undeceived him never reached his hands it was left with lady molino who determined as she was to impede every advance towards a reconciliation between her brother and celestina made no scruple on hearing from whom it came to open read and after some consideration to destroy it of the apparent neglect therefore which celestina imputed to willoughby he had accused her and thought that if she had not determined to connect herself with montague thoroughgood without any attention to his wishes or reliance on his regard she would have written or sent to him while his neglect of a letter by which she thought she should awaken all the tendernesses of friendship which she hoped he still retained for her and the angry and disdainful looks with which he had twice met her wounded both her affection and her pride thus by the treachery of lady molino all commerce even of civility was at an end between them and such was the situation of willoughby when the castle norse arrived in london from italy embarrassed more and more in his affairs and on the point of being overwhelmed with pecuniary distress it was more than time that he should determine what to do and this determination the return of the castle norse to england was intended to hasten always believing that to the artifices of lady Castlenorth he owed his being compelled to quit celestina and still hoping to detect those artifices he had by frequent visits at his uncle's and by a sort of tacit and reluctance acquiescence in many of his plans given miss fitz Heyman great reason to suppose that he intended fulfilling his original engagement with her yet now that he saw he must either continue to act what he could not but feel was a dishonourable and disingenuous part or break with his uncle entirely his uneasiness became more unsupportable the tortures which he had felt in observing the favour celestina had shrewn to montague thurgood by whispering and laughing with him gave him a cruel foretaste of what he should suffer were he to see her married to him yet his reason 
whenever he was calm enough to listen to it, told him how absurd, how improper it was, to indulge such sensations of anguish and regret, since, if the relationship which had been hinted at did really sub-exist between them, he could never take any other part in regard to her than a friendly and fraternal concern in her happiness, and since the age, family, and circumstances of Montague Thorogood were all without objection, he ought, if she believed such an alliance would make her happy, not only to rejoice in it, but promote it. From this, however, his heart absolutely revolted, and all he could prevail upon himself to think of was to make for Celestina some more ample provision if he was once convinced of their relationship, and to wish her happy, for to see her happy when another was to be the object of her love he found would be to him the cruelest punishment that fate could inflict. Sometimes he thought that since every other woman on earth was indifferent to him, he ought to learn to approve of Miss Fitzhaman, of whose apparently increasing affection towards him he could not be insensible. But love was never the effect of effort, and while he compared her with all her labored accomplishments to Celestina, he found too certainly that he never could love her, and that with such sentiments to promise it was an unworthy prostitution of his honor. His coldness, however, and visible reluctance discouraged none of the other parties who desired this marriage, and Miss Fitzhaman, with all that pride which her birth, her fortune, and the exalted idea of her own merit gave her, seemed to be, either from her affection to Willoughby or some other cause, content to receive his hand with the hope of afterwards winning his heart. Convinced that he had no attachment but to Celestina, and certain that the impediments between them must effectually prevent his ever thinking of her with the fond partiality he had done, she seemed very easy as to his indifference towards herself, foreseeing perhaps that their lives would be such after they were married as would very soon produce it, if they did not set out with it, or, to judge more candidly, she might think with pride and pleasure of conquering, as his wife, that coldness to which, as his mistress, she could not be insensible. Lord Castlenorth had so determined a predilection for the match, which the difficulties he had met with had by no means abated, that he would not see anything that appeared inimical to this his darling scheme. His great object was and he forgot his infirmities as he pursued it, to procure for Willoughby the reversion of all his titles, and to change his name to Fitzhaman. This he found would be attended with no great difficulty, and now, whenever he saw his nephew, he enumerated all the species of satisfaction which in his opinion would attend these acquirements. Dwelling with great delight on the circumstance of the family arms remaining unchanged, though he offered to quarter those of Willoughby, if their owner found any reluctance in parting with them entirely. From these harangues, which nothing could for a moment render interesting to Willoughby, his imagination was often quite absent, and sled after Celestina, whom it represented as making the felicity of Montague Thorogood, and enjoying with him that life of elegant and literary retirement, which he had himself fondly hoped to share with her. Frequently, when his uncle was talking to him of his ancestor, 
Reginald Fitz Hayman, who in the reign of Henry the Fourth was slain by the celebrated Hotspur, then in rebellion, after having twice unhorsed him, describing the circumstances of the combat, and still more minutely the bearings thereupon granted in addition to their former coat, Willoughby, far from attending to him, was meditating on some walk he had taken with Celestina during their short happiness at Alvinstone, the preceding spring, on the remarks she had made, and the improvements she had suggested, and having no idea of what his uncle was talking about, only understanding by his tone when he ended a period, he said, to be sure, or certainly, very great, undoubtedly, without knowing or caring whether these words were well placed, while Lord Castlenorth was too much delighted with the pleasure of hearing himself talk on his favourite topic, to remark that Willoughby knew not a syllable of what he was saying, and the latter had really acquired such a habit of inattention to those subjects about which his uncle paraded, that he not unfrequently had, in appearance, assented to plans relative to his fortune, and his residence after his marriage, when, in reality, he had not, on the discourse to which he seemed to listen, formed any one idea. A few days only passed in this manner after the return of the Castlenorths to England, before the extreme pain he felt the second time of seeing Celestina in public, made him sensible of his inability to continue long in this undecided and wretched state. From mere acquiescence in misery, or rather from an hope to escape from it detecting Lady Castlenor's schemes, he had become insensibly more deeply entangled in them and he now began to accuse himself of very unjustifiable conduct, since not all the distressing circumstances of this fortune, not the certainty of Celestina being lost to him, nor the pleasure of saving his paternal estate, and particularly Alvinstone, which, after Celestina had always been his first object, could, on a strict examination of his own heart, lead him to form a serious wish of becoming the husband of Miss Fitzhaman, and he was conscious that every part of his behaviour that had raised contrary expectations was owing rather to his despair of obtaining one woman than to his wish of being united to another. His mind was now in such a state of continual debate and perplexity that nothing had the power a moment to amuse or please him. His sister, without a heart herself, had no notion of the corrosive sensations that preyed on his. His health, though far from being restored, was such as no longer offered her any prospect of becoming the heiress to what family property was left, and since her brother did live, her wish was to have him live in splendour, graced with the happiness of nobility, and reflecting honour on her by his affluence and prosperity. Her dislike of Lady Castlenorth and her daughter was long since lost in the more invertate dislike she had conceived against Celestina since she had been so much seen in good company in London, and so much celebrated for her beauty, she always therefore affected to consider his marriage with Miss Fitzhaman as a settled thing, and from the moment of the Castle Norse return to England she joined, with more zeal than her selfish indolence usually permitted her to feel, for anything in promoting it. 
thus beset by his family and on the other hand harassed by the increasing clamours of his creditors who offered him only the fad alternative of felling alvinstone and whose impatience was formed by the artful management of lady castlenorth willoughby for some little time lingered and hesitated now thought that he ought to marry when such advantages were to be acquired by it now recoiled from the dreadful idea of passing his life with a woman who was indifferent to him and whom he doubted whether he could ever learn to love even in the symptoms of her regard for him which were unequivocal enough there was something which rather disgusted than flattered him and when he thought how different were their minds their tempers and their pursuits no earthly consideration seemed to have sufficient weight with him to make him resolve on putting on a yoke so uneasy to his imagination the repeated sight of celestina made all his wounds bleed afresh he found that neither the suspicions of their relationship or what he thought the certainty of her alienation from him were strong enough to counteract the effect of the long-rooted affection he felt for her but he believed that if those suspicions once amounted to a certainty if once he was thoroughly convinced celestina was his sister he should learn to conquer every other sentiment in regard to her but what he might with honour indulge for this reason and because he found some satisfaction in the delay this journey would give him a pretence for and though that mere change of place would afford him some relief he determined to set out in search of that servant hannah bisco to whom he had obtained a direction in italy and whom he had been detained from visiting partly by his ill state of health and partly by the artifices of lady molyneux after she and lady castlenorth had met however her opposition to this journey was withdrawn and he set out on horseback attended only by his old servant farnham intending to reach the village to which he was directed and which was on the borders of lancashire by easy journeys miss fitzhaman to whom he had said that every consideration urged him to a complete development of the mystery now that it seems to be in his power saw him depart with an appearance of reluctance but willoughby had seen her ever since her arrival in england making parties for public places without him if it happened not to be able or disposed to go and found that during his absence she would proceed in the same course of amusement and that she and her mother would find no inconvenience for want of an escort as they had brought over with them an irish officer who had been in the service of france with whom lady castlenorth had contracted an intimacy a few years before in italy when in their last journey to the continent had been renewed and increased in consequence of which captain cavanagh had accompanied them to london where he had apartments in the house and was become one of the family at all places of public resort he attended on lady castlenorth sat by her at the upper end of the table to carve for her and acted a sort of gentleman usher to the mother while he treated the daughter with the most profound reverence and respect this gentleman was three or four and thirty his face was handsome and his figure though large uncommonly fine he had seen a great deal of service and of the world spoke 
all European languages except English, well, and with all the animation of a Frenchman, had enough of the national character still about him to mark him for an Irishman. He was indeed sufficiently proud of his country, and piqued himself on being descended from the kings of Leinster and Lord Castlenorth, to whom he contrived to render himself agreeable by a patient attention to long stories, by his knowledge of genealogy, by picking up for him old books of heraldry, and understanding the difference between a pale lozenge and a pale engrailed, and affixing some importance to the inquiry whether one of the quarterings of the arms of Fitzhaman should in strictness be on a field argent, a boar's head, cooped gills, or cooped or Lord Castlenorth, among other doubts on this and equally important subjects with which he amused himself, sometimes considered whether the genealogy of Captain Cavanagh might not be traced back in Ireland a generation or two beyond his own in Normandy, a circumstance which excited his respect, and gave, in his opinion, weight and value to those qualities by which the captain contrived to render himself, throughout the family, so very acceptable. Willoughby had seen him with them once or twice abroad, but had not particularly noticed him among the crowd of all nations and descriptions which Lady Castlenorth contrived to collect around her there. He now saw him, not without a slight degree of surprise, domesticated in the family, but his whole attention seemed to be given to the elder members of it, and he hardly ever spoke to Miss Fitzhaman, who, when Willoughby one day took occasion to remark that he was on a footing of greater intimacy than formerly answered, with something like a careless sneer, Oh, you know that Kavanagh has long been my mother's great favourite. In the societies of London, however, this intimacy became the subject of some malicious comments, and Lady Molyneux, who seldom let anything of that sort escape her, could not forbear indulging herself in some remarks on Lady Castlenor's friendship, even before her brother, who gave, however, so little attention to what he heard, that before he reached the end of his first day's journey he had forgot that such a person as the captain existed, as he would probably have forgotten Lady Castlenorth herself, had not the purpose of his present journey and all the transactions of the last twelve months of his life brought her and the consequences of those transactions too forcibly to his memory. While Willoughby was thus on his journey, the disquiet unhappiness of Celestina, though she was compelled to appear to conquer them, were but little abated. Nothing, in the opinion of Lady Horatia, contributed so much to wean the mind from indulging sorrow or encouraging weakness, as variety of company and continual dissipation, and in these notwithstanding her reluctance celestina was continually engaged now she more than ever regretted that she had relinquished that plan of life which she had fixed upon when first left by the death of mrs willoughby to seek a new one the quiet farmhouse in devonshire where cathcat and jessie lived the tender attention she should be there sure to meet with the not unpleasing melancholy of mrs elphinstone and the perfect seclusion she might there enjoy from a world where nothing gave her any real pleasure were ideas which were now 
always returning to her mind with new power there she thought her sad heart might be laid open to the pitying sympathy of her first and most beloved friend and find some satisfaction amongst its own disappointments in witnessing the happiness of that friend to which she had been so great instrumental and there she might wander whole days among the fields and copses indulging herself in repeating the name of willoughby in thinking of him in reading again those books they had read together painting the plants he admired and composing melancholy verses which above every other occupation soothed her mind but when she had represented to herself all the mournful pleasure she should in such a situation enjoy and half determined to gratify herself the ingratitude of which she should be guilty towards lady horatia destroyed her resolves and alas she recollected too that at the farm of jessie she saw from almost every field and from some of the windows of the house elvestone park where miss fitzhaman would soon be mistress the sight she thought she could not bear and her mind turned with terror from the idea of it there were also very strong objections against her going into the immediate neighbourhood of montague thorold if she meant not to give him encouragement and these considerations added to the impracticability of her quitting without better reasons than a mere wish of retirement such a generous protectress as lady horatia determined her to wean her mind from an inclination she could not properly indulge and to move on as well as she could in the wearisome circle till the time arrived when lady horatia set out on her summer tour which was to begin by going to matlock where whence she was to go into wales and then end the summer at cheltenham vassivor had been so long absent that celestina began to hope his pride and resentment had subdued every wish to pursue her in this however she was mistaken a few days after the departure of willoughby he called and was admitted lady horatia and celestina though neither of them were pleased to see him yet received him with civility and entered on common topics such as the occurrences of the day afford to these he appeared very inattentive and turning abruptly to celestina he said miss de moray cannot i speak to you alone she hesitated a moment and then said i believe mr vassiver there is nothing you can have to communicate to me that ought to be secret to lady horatia howard there is madam returned he with quickness and appearing much displeased with her apparent disinclination to oblige him for what i have to say relates in some measure to others whose confidence i have no right to betray whatever i may choose to do in those circumstances that relate only to myself lady horatia now rose and said my dear oblige mr vassiver if he wishes to speak to you without witnesses then she left the room now madam said vassiver as soon as she had shut the door now you have no longer an excuse to repulse or deny me willoughby assuredly quits you for ever and nothing ought nothing shall impede my pretensions emily my poor emily herself on whose account i own to you i have hesitated more than once wishes my success and bids me say that convinced my happiness depends upon you she withdraws every claim which she had on my heart and beseeches you to believe it is not unworthy your acceptance emily sir cried celestina in some surprise 
of whom do you speak and how can a person to whose very name i am stranger be likely in such a case to influence me don't affect said he the ridiculous prudery of disclaiming any knowledge of her because she does not rank among those who are falsely called virtuous women by heaven she has virtues that might redeem the vices of half her sex not one in a thousand of whom possess a twentieth part of her worth i mean not answered celestina mildly to dispute her value but only to ask on what pretension you urge to me either the resignation or opinions of a person with whom i have no acquaintance why will you pretend not to know her resumed he with redoubled impetuosity why affect not to know that emily who has lived with me almost twelve months is a sister of your mrs elphinstone and of that cathcart whom willoughby picked up and placed as his steward at elphinstone i have heard there is such a person said celestina but i did not know she lived with you yes she has lived with me some time though i did not till lately know her family unworthy and disgraced as you may think her she should at this moment have been mistress of my house and my fortune but what you would call legal claims if i had not like a cursed fool as i am taken up a passion for you which i cannot get rid of and which my generous little girl not only knows but with disinterested affection instead of trying to dissuade me from it wishes me to succeed in i have sometimes fancied that your knowledge of my attachment to her was in my way and that circumstance together with the eternal mystery that always hung over willoughby's intentions in short my hopes of being cured of a damned folly by reason and absence instead of matrimony have altogether made me refrain from visiting you lately but now i think since george is gone out of town and returns only to be married to miss fitzhaman there is an end of that and for my experiment curse me if i believe it will do and so here i am again more in love and a greater blockhead than ever don't however mistake me celestina i will not i cannot bear to be tristled with nor will i sacrifice one hour either to your coquetry or to the observed partiality which i sometimes used to believe you had for that whining snivelling montague thoroughgood if there are no other pretensions than his in the way i shall soon know how to settle the matter really mr vassiver said celestina as soon as he would give her an opportunity of speaking your conduct and manners are so eccentric that it is difficult to know what to say to you which you will not call either prudery or coquetry or impute to a partiality for some other person permit me however to tell you with that sincerity with which i have always spoke on this subject that i am sensible of the honour you do me but that i never can accept even though my situation were to be more humble than it is and though such a man as mr montague thurgood have never existed oh very well madam cried vassiver impatiently interrupting her you must however allow me to ask your objections are they to my person my family my fortune i have already said sir that they are all unexceptionable well madam i must infer from your refusal that you are engaged no sir that inference by no means follows pardon me if i say 
that notwithstanding all the advantages you possess it is possible for a person to decline the honour of your addresses without being engaged however madame do you or do you not deny that such an engagement does exist of that i think i have a right to inquire forgive me sir if i answer that it does not seem to me that you have any right in the world to ask that question of me well then i shall ask it elsewhere where you have if possible still less right said celestina alarmed at his vehemence you are however very quick at understanding to whom i allude certainly after what you have just said i cannot mistake your meaning you allude to mr montague thoroughgood damn him cried vassiver rising and speaking with vehemence that made her shudder that puppy crosses me like a my evil genius by any man at all worthy of you i might perhaps bear to be supplanted but by such a silly fellow as that no damn it there is no enduring it curse me if it does not make me frantic hear me then mr vassiver hear me for the last time for i will never again willingly expose myself to this sort of treatment i am not engaged to mr thoroughgood it is not likely i sh ever shall be engaged to him and farther i again protest to you that did not that did no such person exist it would make no difference in the resolution i have made never to listen to the offers with which you honour me this declaration repeated so strongly served but to inflame those passions which celestina hoped it would repress and piqued his pride without destroying what he called love he walked backwards and forwards in the room a moment or two and seemed to be reasoning with that extravagant warmth of temper she had complained of but his eyes and his manner expressed plainly what he forbore to utter after a while he appeared to have conquered the inclination he felt to give way to the rage that possessed him and sitting down by her he softened his voice as much as he could though he it trembled through the variety of emotions he felt and endeavoured to speak calmly while he said celestina if this be really the case if i may venture to believe you you will not surely refuse to satisfy me a little farther i am not a vain coxcomb but i know that neither my figure nor my understanding are contemptible i have a very affluent fortune and i have a heart that as you well know adores you willoughby cannot or will not marry you of that i think you can no longer doubt you say that you are not engaged to the young dr thoroughgood tell me then what there is that overbalancing so many points in my favour renders them all ineffectual and i will tell you candidly mr vassiver my objections then are to your morals to your principles they may not be and i dare say are not worse than those of other young men of fortune who have equal opportunities of following their own inclinations but however that may be they are such as would inevitably make me unhappy and knowing that it would be extreme folly were any advantages which influence can offer to induce me to risk it my morals cried vassiver again my morals and pray what part of what are you pleased to call my morals is it that gives you so much offence all answered she your manner of life your attachments your connections 
which you have just acknowledged you could not without hesitation and reluctance quit still you will misunderstand me what i said in regard to emily surely went to a very different meaning i told you that you are the only woman upon earth for whom i would quit her and the greater my regard has been for her surely the greater it makes out my attachment for you for whom i would relinquish her but heaven i cannot tell how far my affection for her might have carried me if my passion for you had not taken so deep root in my heart and curse me if amidst it all i do not still love her dearly and would give half my estate to make her happy and re-establish her health but poor dear girl she will never i am afraid recover if her illness is occasioned by her fears of losing you sir said celestina remove at once the cause of it by thinking of me no more if you love her as much as you express surely this cannot be difficult and why feeling this attachment to a person whom you think so deserving of it should you contrary to the dictates of reason pursue one who never can return the good opinion you entertain of her because of my morals ridiculous cant and falsehood don't i know that women all like the very libertism they are pleased outwardly to condemn don't i know that the proudest the most prudish among ye are flattered by the attention of those men who are called the greatest rakes and that if any queer fellow sets up to be a moral man ye all laugh and despise him this sort of stuff about morals you have learned i suppose either from old parson thoroughgood or this good motherly gentlewoman you live with but you who have so much sense cannot seriously persist in such method methodistical cant and as to any objections about emily don't mistake me mr vassiver i made no mention of her in the way of objection well then cried he interrupting her as to my morals in every other respect they are really exemplary i play comparatively very little i don't drink a fifth part so much as half the people i live with and i reckon myself upon the whole a very orderly sober fellow by comparison only said celestina half smiling at his way of making out the account ay by comparison everything in this world is you know good or bad only by comparison come come celestina i was willing enough to allow for your prepossession in favour of george willoughby but to any other i cannot i will not submit nor will i allow anything to this damn prudery i know myself worthy of you highly as i think of you yes i deserve you if it be only for my preserving love and by all that's good i will not be denied you really will sir replied celestina who more and more distressed by his perseverance desire to put an end to it for ever if possible you really will for i protest to you that i never can give any other answer than i have already given and i beg i entreat that you will desist from a pursuit that can produce for you only mortification may i perdition seize me if i do returned he with renewed vehemence no if i perish in the attempt i will persevere he was proceeding in this strain when lady horatia sent to let celestina know she waited for her to go out and she took the opportunity of hastening away 
glad to be relieved from a conversation so distressing, while Vassiver, finding all attempts to detain her ineffectual, left the house in one of those paroxysms of passion with disappointment, from his having never been used to submit to it, always produced. End of Volume 4 Chapter 1 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 4, Chapter 2 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 4, Chapter 2. It would be difficult to say whether Willoughby, wandering and solitary among the remote villages of Yorkshire, or Celestina, surrounded in London by what the world calls pleasure and amusement, was the most internally wretched. Celestina's last dialogue with Vassiver had convinced her that Willoughby no longer thought of her even with that degree of friendship and tenderness which he had so often assured her nothing should destroy he was gone out of town merely to prepare for his marriage and gone without deigning either to see her or answer the letter she had written to him there was in such conduct so much unkindness and inhumanity that she began to hope her reflections on it would be by degrees abate the anguish she now felt, and she listened to Lady Horatia, who continually spoke of it as an unequivocal proof of Willoughby's want of an heart capable of a generous and steady attachment. To Montague Thorogood, however, who now again returned to town after an absence on business of some little time, she could not listen with so much complacency as her friend wished, and she repeatedly told him that the greatest obligation he could confer upon her would be to desist from talking to her of love. The certainty, however, there now seemed to be that Willoughby, no longer considered himself as interested about her, her positive rejection of Mr. Vassiver, and the encouragement given him by Lady Horatia to persevere, brought him continually to the house, where their morning parties of reading recommenced, and whenever they went out of an evening, Montague Thoroughgood was their attendant thus drinking intoxicating draughts of love, and indulging hope that it would finally be successful. Willoughby now found without difficulty the person he sought, and whether it was that she had her lesson more completely, or was permitted to speak plainer of what she knew, she answered his inquiries in such a way as served to perplex, but not entirely to infirm the question whether Celestina was his mother's daughter. The woman was, in her mind and ideas, one of the lowest of the vulgar, yet her simplicity seemed to be affected, and all the proofs which had been talked of did not amount to her declaring that she was present at the birth of Celestina, or could produce any positive evidence of it she spoke principally to the time when she said the little girl was at nurse at kensington of which she related a great many particulars that staggered willoughby more than ever without convincing him yet all the woman said though it was consistent had the air of having been learned by rote and there was about her a sort of guarded cunning which seemed to have been acquired or at least improved by long practice willoughby attempted to discover whether she had not received money 
from Lady Castlenorth, and to find what were her present means of substance. But for these inquiries she also seemed prepared, and gave at least a plausible account of a legacy left her by a great uncle, that enabled her to live without servitude in her native country, where she boarded with a relation, and affected great piety and sanctity. She blessed God, she said, that she scorned for the lucre of gain to belay any one, dead or alive, much more her good mistress who was gone. But truth was truth, and she hoped, by the help of God, always to speak it plain and direct, without fee or reward. And as for Lady Castlenorth, added she, whom your honour thinks has paid me for speaking of this thing, pray consider your honour wherein it could be useful to my lady to put me upon saying a falsity if i was base enough to take money of my lady for it which to be certain i never did for what would that be as your honour well knows but selling my immortal soul and what good as i may say would all the gold and diamonds in the world do me, if my precious soul was to perish because of them? This cant, to which Willoughby listened with continued patience, made him hope that he should, in some instance or another, detect her of inconsistency. But, though he saw her repeatedly, and set Farnham to watch her still more narrowly, and to talk the matter over with her as if in confidence, she was always so guarded that no contradiction could be discovered, and after waiting near a week at the village, Willoughby was compelled to give up every idea of certainty coming at the truth, and to return towards London without being positively sure that Celestina was so nearly related to him yet forced to allow that he could not, in contradiction to all he had heard of a child nursed in secret at Kensington, bring any sort of evidence on which he ought to rely that she was not so. Sick at heart, and feeling too sensibly that all his future life must be unhappy, his mind sunk in total despondence. Too certain it was, that under such circumstances he could not think of marrying Celestina, yet he was unhappy, conscious that he could not bear to think of her marrying another. It was in vain he accused himself of something worse than folly. The moment his mind dwelt on the subject, he found that folly irresistible, and while he determined that one of the first things he would do on his return should be to make a provision for Celestina out of his remaining fortune, he sickened in recollecting that such a provision would probably but facilitate her marriage with Montague Thorogood, and of Montague Thorogood he could not think with patience. Of his own situation in regard to the family of Fitzhamon, he thought with equal bitterness. He was but too conscious that to obtain the information he wanted from Hannah Bisco, which he had flattered himself would turn out very differently. He had renewed his attendance at the house of his uncle, and acted disingenuously and unlike himself. However indifferent or adverse he was, to his cousin, his honour forbade him any longer to trifle with those sentiments which she evidently entertained in his favour. What then should he do? This question came continually before him, and was continually debated without his being able to form any resolution on which he could for a moment rest without pain. He sometimes thought, that since in losing the only woman whom he could love, he had lost all that could render his life happy, 
it was immaterial what became of him and that since he must be miserable it might as well be in following as in flying from what he still thought was in some degree a duty completing the enlarged engagement that he had made to his mother on her death-bed in doing this he should gratify all his surviving relations and retrieve his estate which he must otherwise sell as the mortgages upon it were rapidly devouring it and to do this was as he sometimes tried to persuade himself to pay a debt he owed his ancestors he had been educated by his mother in high ideas of the consequence and respectability not only of her family but of that of his father but of these prejudices his natural good sense he had suffered very little to remain so that if he now endeavoured to recall them in support of those arguments which he ran over in favour of his marriage his understanding immediately revolted against them i shall not only retrieve said he but argument my fortune not only save alvestone but add to my present estate the family possessions of my mother which will otherwise become the property of strangers the honours too so long inherited by her ancestors will be mine he frequently made efforts to fix his mind on these advantages but the moment he began seriously to investigate their value he beheld them with contempt ridiculous cried he my ancestors what is this foolish family pride for which i am meditating to sell my freedom in acquiescence with narrow prejudice i shall have a large estate but will it make me happier in myself or more respected by those whose respect can afford me any pleasure i shall be called my lord a mighty satisfaction truly the vulgar for with such empty sounds the vulgar only are delighted will bow low to my lordship and i shall take place at country meetings above the neighbouring esquires who are now my equals i shall have a bauble called a coronet painted on my coach doors and my hall chairs and shall become one of the legislator qualified for it only by the possession of that bauble perhaps half a dozen or half a hundred men and women of poor ambition may court the notice and boast of the acquaintance of lord castlenorth who would have let mr willoughby remain unmolested by their kindness and by such friends my house will be infested and my leisure destroyed but i shall go to court and be named as having appeared at the drawing-room that will be very delectable certainly and my wife's fine clothes will be described at full length and the taste of my equipage be commended in all the newspapers it will be there told of me that i am gone to this or that my, of my country houses and my six bays or greys or blacks will be celebrated in hyde park or be conspicuous in the roads within twenty miles of london while a thousand insignificant insipid beings whom i neither know nor desire to know shall say what a beautiful carriage what a well-appointed equipage is that of my lord castlenorth all this felicity in the aggregate and i know of no more than belongs to the possession of a title is certainly well worth the sacrifice i shall make to obtain it and my ancestors from their airy clouds will be infinitely delighted by the glory of their descendant but what will that descendant be in reality a mercenary a miserable wretch condemned to pass his life with a woman whom if he does not loathe he does not love to feel him a purchased husband 
and to have sold in sad exchange men's best birthright freedom for a mess of pottage to such soliloquies as these succeeded determinations to carry no farther any semblance of attention to miss fitzhaman but to go even from his present journey and without passing through london immediately abroad to mind unable to resist misery there frequently appears a possibility of flying from it and while willoughby dreaded the thoughts of returning to london he fancied that if he could cross over from hull to the north of europe he should leave some part of his present unhappiness behind him unsettled and unhappy as he was these debates with himself these vague plans of quitting everything and becoming a wanderer on earth became more usual with him but still he decided on nothing the idea of being compelled to sell elvestone was the only one however that had great weight with him to think that the place to which he had been so fondly attached should become the property of some upstart man of sudden fortune was accompanied by a sensation of acute uneasiness he imagined those beautiful woods the growth of centuries fallen in compliance with the improving taste of a broker or a warehouseman the park ploughed up to be converted into farms and the elegant simplicity of his house and his grounds destroyed by gothic windows or chinese ornaments the shrubberies where he had wandered with celestina that turf where he had ran by her side when she was learning to ride and where they used to walk arm in arm together that house where he had hoped she would preside and grace so lovely a scene with a mistress yet more lovely all all were to become the property of another and the very name of willoughby and what was yet more painful the name of celestina should never more in those scenes be remembered yet in a moment the cruel truth occurred to him that whether this place belonged to him or another celestina would never again visit it that he should never again hear her voice calling him among the beech woods or trace her footsteps on the turf never listen to her as she read in his mother's dressing-room or hold her hand within his as they sat together on the woody banks of the waterfall and marked its sparkling current leap from rock to rock and without her what would elvestone be but a place where every spot would be haunted by melancholy images of departed happiness how little the indulgence of these painful contemplations would be interrupted or put an end to by any satisfaction he could derive from the conversation of miss fitzhaman his sick and reluctant heart too plainly told him and then he again believed himself determined to sell all his estates and quit england if not for ever at least till time absence and the impossibility of his changing it had better reconciled him to that destiny which condemned him to give up celestina and to see her in the arms of another a desultory and unsettled life had within the last year become habitual to him and while he was actually moving from one place to another his spirits preyed less corrosively on themselves since to live as he wished to have lived in his own country was impossible he thought he should regret it less while he was wandering over others and since he could not now contemplate the face and character he so fondly loved he hoped that variety of characters and variety of faces would divert his regret if they could not cure his attachment 
there was too an idea of freedom and independence which accompanied his thus shaking off at once every encumbrance that was not within its charms and this disposition he thought contemptuously of mere local preference as unworthy a strong mind and determined to become a citizen of the world and when his imagination he had settled his route through holland and france to sicily where he had long wished to see and from thence to the archipelago he breathed freer and felt himself more reconciled to existence he journeyed however slowly towards london while these debates were carrying on and at york whither he had ordered his letters to be directed he found one from cathcart which related some circumstances in regard to his affairs that convinced him he could not unless to the material injury of some persons who were connected with him quit england without some regulation of these pecuniary concerns which he had so long neglected and would now willingly have escaped from this letter determined him to return to london though another letter from his sister in which she mentioned as an article of news that celestina was either actually married to montague thoroughgood or on the point of being so threw him into a state of mind bordering on distraction reason which had long fruitlessly contended against this fatal and perhaps guilty attachment now seemed tired of a contention so hopeless and his mind became a chaos of conflicting passions all equally destructive to his mental and bodily health to return to london however was become necessary and farnham his old faithful servant persuaded him to take post chaise for the rest of his journey he arrived after an absence of above three weeks at the house of lady molyneux and there heard that a few days before lady horatia howard had publicly spoken of celestina's marriage with the young divine as a settled thing that his father had brought for him a considerable living in gloucestershire where they were to reside and where a curate was settled till he was himself qualified to take it and thither as there was a very good house upon it they were going immediately after their marriage willoughby heard all this without being able to make a reply and then hastened to his own lodgings from whence he dispatched farnham for intelligence from the servants of lady horatia the coachman with whom he had some time before made an acquaintance and who was a very talkative fellow immediately informed him of all he knew and much that he imagined he said it was very true that mr thoroughgood lived almost always at their house and my lady said the man my lady loves him for all the world as if he was her own son there they are all morning reading playbooks and such together as my fellow servants tell me that is my lady and miss and this here young divine as is to be and then they go out in my coach all's one as if they belong to the same family and i do understand as how my lady is to give her a portion and they are to be married out of hand that is in a little time and believe that's the very truth of the thing for my lady have bought another coach horse within these ten days and told me abraham says she i shall go early next month into gloucestershire instead of going to matlock as i talked of and i shall go in the coach instead of the post-chaise because i have some friends with me 
this account which farham faithfully repeated to willoughby confirmed almost beyond a doubt all lady molyneux had related to him some more recent intelligence that he had received from cathcart as to the embroiled state of his affairs in the country combined to render him desperate and he had been so long harassed between his love and his interest his honour and his reluctance that he suddenly took the resolution of putting it out of his own power to undergo again such variety of torments like a wretch who leaps from a ship on fire into the sea though certain of meeting death in another shape he formed the determination of making himself since he must be wretched as completely wretched as possible he thought of celestina as his relation in vain it abated nothing of that anguish with which he considered her as the wife of montague thorogood and so hideous were the images that forced themselves upon him that he found his reason had no power to subdue them and though that nothing could so decidedly oblige him to check them as his marriage and without giving himself time to consider how desperate was the remedy he went immediately to the house of lord castlenorth declared to him that he was satisfied as to the object of his journey and took the most immediate opportunity after his return of expressing his solicitude to avail himself of his cousin's generous predilection in his favour and to fulfil the wishes of his deceased mother and his surviving family the eager and tremendous manner in which lie uttered all this and which was in reality the effect of despair and anguish lord castlenorth mistook for the anxiety and impatience of love his nephew had never spoke this decisively before and seeing thus what he had so long fondly wished for out of doubt his first idea was to proceed instantly in securing to willoughby the revision of those titles on which he had set so high a value himself while therefore he sat out in his chariot supported by mrs calder who always attended him to solicit the completion of a business which he had hither proceeded but slowly and fancied the happiness of all parties would be wonderfully advanced by his success willoughby with such sensations as determined suicide alone could envy was making to lady castlenorth the same declaration and was immediately afterwards allowed or rather desired to present himself at the feet of her fair daughter end of volume four chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Volume 4, Chapter 3 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith Volume 4 Chapter 3 To play the lover is not difficult to most men, even where their hearts are not really interested. A few fine speeches, a little commonplace declamation, are easily produced and generally accepted, but Willoughby, always a very poor dissembler, and who felt in despite of every effort to repress them sentiments towards miss fitzhaman bordering on antipathy was very conscious that he should ill answer her ideas of a passionate lover and this consciousness deprived him of the little power he might otherwise have had to dissemble 
he now with increased confusion of thought repented that he had gone so far but to recede was impossible and with a countenance expressive rather of perturbation and wretchedness than all of the pleasurable sensations inspired by successful love he entered the apartment where miss fitz Heyman had been prepared by lady castlenorth to receive his tender professions he approached her and took her hand muttered something about the final eclaircissement of his doubts as to another person for he dared not trust his voice with the name of celestina and something about being in consequence of that eclaircissement released from his former engagements then in a still more tremendous and uncertain tone he solicited her permission to dedicate his life to her service and to hasten those preparations for his happiness which his former uncertainties and embarrassments had put it out of his power to solicit with that ardour which he should under other circumstances have invinced the falsehood he was uttering died away almost inarticulately on his lips and his revolting heart reproached him for it faint and reluctant as it was as he finished his speech miss fitzhaman turned her large black eyes which had till then been modestly cast down full upon him she seemed to have been trying to make them speak tenderness but to him they expressed nothing but an imperious inquiry into the truth of his professions from which he shrunk in a moment however those eyes so little calculated for the soft parley of affection contrived to overflow with tears she gave him the hand he had just before let go and inclining her head tenderly towards him said in terms as gentle as she could command o oh, willoughby you know too well you have long known my unfortunate partiality towards you a partiality which with reluctance and with regret i own not all your too evident coldness has conquered alas could i now believe you sincere believe it i conjure you cried he in a hurried voice and hastening to put an end to a dialogue which he found he could so ill support believe it dear madame and believe what is true also that i have now no other engagement no other attachment and cannot but be be truly sensible of your extraordinary merit i will believe it answered she i will endeavour to believe it for i find that even if i am deceived the deceit is dear to me willoughby then kissed her hand with as much warmth as he could affect and running over in the breathless tremor which consciousness of his disingenuous conduct occasioned a few commonplace sentences about eternal gratitude an unalterable love speeches which have probably been repeated ten million of times with as little sincerity but seldom with so much self-reproof he led her to talk of preparations and equipages and jewels subjects on which she entered with such ease as shrewd that her mind had been familiarized to consider them and that they were not without importance in her opinion poor willoughby who now felt his fate irretrievable had very different sensations oppressed and bewildered by a variety of sufferings yet compelled by the part he thus rashly determined to act to stifle them all his prevailing idea was that since the rubicon was now passed the sooner this dreaded marriage was over the better for him since his mind must then combat with more force than it could now do those wild eccentricities 
the offspring of despair which were crowding fast upon him he therefore pressed for an early day not with the vehemence of love but with that of a wretch who knowing he must die wishes to hear his physician fix the period when his torments are likely to end miss fitz Heyman, however either could not or would not discover this and though his inflamed eyes his short sighs unsettled manner and broken sentences gave him altogether the appearance rather of a man suffering under some recent calamity than of a favoured and fortunate lover on the point of obtaining his happiness the lady either from her confidence in her own charms or from some other cause was perfectly satisfied with his behaviour and before he left her promised that she would not oppose the arrangement which she understood to have been made by her father that in three weeks he should receive her hand this then was determined without possibility of recall and willoughby too sensible already of the weight of those chains which he had thus hastily forged for himself now disengaged himself as soon as possible and ran out of the house impatient to be alone and to contemplate in the stillness of his own room the prospect of misery into which he had thus rashly bound himself to rush he walked very fast and as if he was flying from himself towards his lodgings in bond street where as he passed along it a crowd of passengers near one of the crossings impeded his passage he regarded them not but made his way eagerly among them till he was immediately between a footman who waited at the door of a coach and a young lady who was coming out of a shop to step into it on his pressing rather hastily before her the servant put him back with his hand willoughby out of humour at that moment with himself and with all the world and fancying the action of the footman impertinent spoke to him very harshly and was almost provoked to strike him when the lady who had her foot on the step appeared a good deal alarmed and no sooner heard the sound of his voice thus menacing than she caught the servant's arm for support and at the same moment willoughby who had not till then seen her face beheld the lovely but pale and terrified countenance of celestina thrown entirely off his guard and not knowing what he did he took the hand with which she had supported herself against the servant celestina cried he o oh god it is you celestina she looked at him with eyes where surprise was softened by tenderness and tried to recover voice enough to utter more than willoughby which the immediate emotion drew from her but he gave her no time for fixing his eyes on hers all that she had been to him all that he believed she was now to another and all that he had just agreed to be himself rushed upon his recollection at once and in agony of grief remorse and despair he threw her hand from him and turning away he walked or rather ran towards his lodgings as if he had been pursued by the furries where without giving his servant time to open it he rapped at the door with violence enough to break it down so fearful he seemed of again seeing celestina as she passed in the coach which by the horses being in that direction would he thought come that way farnham his servant who opened the door was amazed at his impatience so unlike his usual manner and with still more surprise saw him instead of speaking and inquiring for letters as he always did when he came in and was particularly likely now to do after so long an absence 
rushed by him as if he had not seen him, and hurrying upstairs by two steps at a time, shut the door of the dining-room with a violence that shook the whole house, and turned the key. This faithful servant had lived with him from the time of his leaving school, and was more attached to his master than to any other person on earth. He had seen with deep concern the sad change that had happened in his health and in his temper since that unfortunate night when he so suddenly left Alvinstone the year before, and had, in all his journeys and all his illness, watched over him with assiduous and attentive care. He had often known him dejected, and almost sinking under his uncertainties and his disappointments, but had never till now observed such fury in his eyes, and marks of desperation in his manner, alarmed at the circumstance of his having locked the door of his room. Farnham was immediately beset with numberless fearful conjectures. He was aware that his master's affairs were far from being prosperous, and imagined it possible that he might be pursued for debt, and, as he knew his pride would render such a thing almost insupportable, he feared least in the sudden agony to which it might subject him he might commit some violence on himself. Willoughby's temper was naturally very mild, and not easily inflamed to anger, but when that did happen his anger was dreadful, and though Farnham had only once or twice seen it excited during his long service, he knew how terrible it was when thoroughly roused. The conjectures that Farnham entertained were not to be supported calmly, and though he had always received strict orders never to enter the room where his master was busy, till he rang or called for him, he was now strongly tempted, yet dared not determine to disobey his commands. He could not, however, forbear going to the door and listening. He heard his master utter deep and convulsive sighs. He heard him walking by starts in the room, but, by the keys being left in the lock, he could see nothing. He then went softly into the bedchamber, and from thence a defect in the door, which opened from it into the dining-room, enabled him to distinguish that Willoughby now sat by a table on which his arms were thrown, and on them he rested his head, while his hair all in disorder, concealed every part of his face. Then, in a moment, starting up, he traversed the room with quick and uncertain steps, now clasping his hands together, now throwing them wildly abroad. At length he stopped, and striking his forehead, said in a voice rather resembling groaning than speaking, O oh, accursed, accursed wretch, what hast thou done? Still more alarmed by these words, and by beholding the frantic gestures with which his master now leaned against the side of the chimney, now flew to the other side of the room, and now threw himself on the sofa, Farnham again debated with himself whether he should not go in at any event. There was a coteau de chaise and a sword hung up in the room, and two brace of pistols in their cases, which Farnham had just put there, loaded as they were when his master travelled, and the poor fellow fancied that on these, whenever he passed them, his master looked wildly eager. This might be some time fancy, but at length, either from accident or from his feeling, at that instant some horrible temptation to escape from the evils that just then appeared quite intolerable, Willoughby stopped with folded arms opposite to these instruments of destruction, and while his expressive countenance was marked with the severest anguish, 
he murmured inarticulately some words where farnham interpreted as determination to put an end to his sufferings bent at any hazard to prevent his executing this fearful threat the affrighted servant now searched with trembling hands for the lock which he forgot he could not open his master demanded in a voice which struck him with terror who was there when luckily for him a thundering rap at the street door gave him hopes that some visitors might be coming who might more properly and effectually interfere and he flew down to let them in regardless of willoughby who coming out to the top of the stairs called to him and peremptorily ordered him to admit nobody it was sir philip molyneux who having just met lord castlenorth at the minister's levee had heard from him that willoughby immediately on his arrival in town had agreed to the conclusion of his marriage and that in consequence of it he had himself been attending the levy to hasten the affair of the revisionary titles which affair was likely to be speedily concluded sir philip therefore having received this intelligence called as he went home to congratulate his brother-in-law and to take him to dinner in portman square little accustomed as sir philip was to make remarks on anybody's appearance and particularly on that of his inferiors he was notwithstanding struck with the countenance of farnham as pale and aghast as he opened the door to him as he went before him upstairs he inquired what ailed him i hardly know indeed sir replied farnham but my master who came from barnet only early this morning as you know i suppose sir off his yorkshire journey has been out somewhere since and is come home in such a humour as i am sure i have never seen him in all the years i have lived with him be so good sir however as not to take notice that i spoke about it sir philip had no time to promise he would not before they were at the door of the dining-room where willoughby stood and sternly said to his servant how dare you sir disobey me in this manner did i not tell you stupid hound that i would not be at home lord sir cried farringham in great distress for he was little accustomed and could hardly bear to be thus harshly reproved lord sir it is only sir philip and i am sure i thought curse on your thoughts cried willoughby blockhead are you to think for me hey day said sir philip what's all this don't be angry with poor farnham i would come in for i was impatient to wish you joy joy sir of what why i have this moment seen lord castlenorth who has told me that everything is settled at last come i'm very glad to hear it for it must be owned that this business george has advanced but slowly well so now tis to be done directly the old peer was quite frisky upon it and forgot his asthma and his gout to stand till i was tired of hearing him telling me of the regulation he made as to your name he becomes earl and viscount castlenorth and you take as your title that of baron ravensborough i heard the history too of how that came into the family well but george you'll go dine with us lady molyneux will be glad perhaps to hear about it and wish you joy joy damnation rather muttered willoughby as snatching away his hand he fled to the other end of the room then by an effort recovering himself a little he returned towards sir philip and said with forced calmness prithee don't te 
seize me with those hateful commonplace congratulations surely it is bad enough for a fellow to be forced to hear them afterwards and indeed bad enough to be married without having them rung in his ears for a month beforehand sir philip who now saw very plainly that his reluctance was by no means subdued had no inclination to argue the matter with him he had no idea why he might not be happy with Miss Fitzhaman, or any other woman of equal fortune, but whether he was so or no, his solicitude went no further than that his brother-in-law might not be reduced either to a state of indigence such as might disgrace his alliance or compel him to borrow money of his relations, and as Willoughby's marriage with Miss Fitzhaman would preclude the possibility of any such awkward circumstances, he heartily wished it, and had of late forgot his usual apathy to join with his wife in promoting it. There was, he thought, no occasion for argument in the present case, since the affair was now, whether Willoughby liked it or no, irrevocably fixed upon he therefore spared himself the fatigue of remarks or recumstance on willoughby's behaviour and only said but you'll dine with us george to-day will you not no i cannot replied willoughby to-morrow then we shall have a large party and dine exactly at seven o'clock i will if i can but i can engage for nothing i hate to be fettered by engagements but if i can come i will shall i ring for your servants they are at the door says sir philip who immediately went away without having any great reason to be satisfied with the politeness of his brother-in-law of that however he thought not and if the behaviour of willoughby afterwards occurred to him at all it only created a momentary surprise mingled with some degree of pity which his absurdity and not his evident unhappiness excited his visit however had the effect of rousing willoughby from that dreadful condition of mind into which the step he had taken that morning in regard to miss fitzhaman and the sudden sight of celestina had thrown him he now became able to collect his thoughts and was at once conscious of the general folly of his conduct and of his cruel behaviour to farnham who was so hurt by having seen his master in such a state and by the unkind and unusual way in which he had spoken to him that when the poor fellow came up to inquire if he would please to dress the tears were in his eyes and he was hardly able to speak willoughby was of too noble a nature not to apologize for his fault the moment he felt it he answered mildly that he should dress directly and then said farnham i spoke angrily to you just now and I am sorry for it. I was vexed, and could not command my temper. You were wrong, too, in letting in Sir Philip Molyneux. Another time remember that when I give orders to be denied, I expect nobody unless I particularly name them. Poor Farthingham dared not say why he then ventured to disobey him but in the most humble terms begged his pardon and said he was very sorry well well cried willoughby with a deep sigh and i am very sorry farringham that i was so foolishly passionate let us think no more of it he then bade him get his things to dress and tried by taking up a book to divert his thoughts from himself and obtain at least a respite from the corrosive reflections that pursued him 
but it would not do he threw the book away and felt notwithstanding all his efforts his wretchedness and impatience returning while farnham who as he dressed his hair watched every turn of his countenance saw but too plainly that his master was half distracted by something into which he dared not inquire this gave a sort of unquiet flowness to his manner which willoughby observing was on the point of relapsing into that sort of behaviour for which he had but the moment before expressed his sorrow and impetuously bade him mind what he was about to make haste then hardly suffering him to finish his hair he started up and putting on his clothes in the haste that denoted the unquietness of his mind he sent for a hackney coach and ordered it to set him down at the hotel in soho square farnham still apprehending that some fatal event might follow all the agitation of mind which he had witnessed now approached again and asked if he should be at home in the evening or sup at home to which willoughby no longer able to check himself answered no as he drew up the glass in an accent that terrified poor farnham who more and more confirmed in his notion that something was about to befall his master now concluded that something was a duel the pistols and the sword indeed were still hanging up in the dining-room but yet he could not be easy and after some consideration he determined to go and inquire among the servants at st philip molyneux and at lord castlenorse if they could at all guess what was the matter and with most of the latter he was particularly acquainted by having been much with them at florence and naples when his master was last abroad end of volume four chapter three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c